This is a hypothetical universe, but it incorporates a fundamental fact established by the pound Repka and other experiments that were touted as proving Einstein's relativity. To understand the reality of our universe, you have to forget about relativity and look at what the experiments actually show us. And the pound Repka was supposed to show us that clock speeds decrease the closer you get to the surface of the Earth, and they increase as you leave the surface of the Earth. And I need to remind everybody at this point, the natural definition of length depends on clock speed. In other words, if the clock speed slows down, the length of a meter stick will shrink. Now, this is kind of consistent, isn't it, with the center of a black hole being uh, a singularity. The yardstick has shrunk to nothing. But we forget that locally, or the physicists forget that locally, the clock speed also diminishes to near zero. All along the path, locally, the yardstick, meter stick, is exactly the same. Neither length nor clock speed change locally. It's not a matter of experience. Now, of course, if you're entering into a black hole, the strength of gravity would certainly crush you. No, nope, that isn't an argument. But what we want to do here is we want to take this yardstick and travel with it anywhere we want to in the universe. And we could discover that as we approach bodies of mass, the yardstick will shrink, clock speeds will shrink, but to us it's all the same. And the result of that is that if we were to measure the universe from end to end, which is actually a sphere, not an ellipse, it would always be the same. No matter which direction we went, we would have a radius of the universe. And yes, the universe does have a radius. This isn't a matter of argument. Um, so if the entire universe were to double in size, the yardsticks would double in size, clock speeds would double, and there would be absolutely no discernible change whatsoever. There isn't a gravitational issue there because the density of the universe would decrease by half if the volume of the universe were to double. So in the cosmic sense, and we're defining cosmic expansion as that which where the raisins expand along with the dough, not like the Big Bangers, but the raisins expand with the dough. So this is a fact. It's a fact, a proven fact, that not proof of Einstein's relativity, but a proven fact that the universe could shrink to the size of a pea from an external point of view outside the universe, but inside the universe, everything would be exactly the same. So there would have never been a possibility of any Big Bang for us. Of course, there could be a different kind of expansion. <clears throat> Not cosmic expansion, but a different kind of expansion where all the particles are actually moving apart from each other. However, if you take a look at, at what would happen in, the, in that case is that from an outside point of view, the density of the universe would still be, remain the same. And so there is no possibility whatsoever that conditions would change or that that kind of, of, well, let's hold off on that matter for a little bit. Um, it turns out that the universe is fixed in size. And this is what we're looking at right here. It's fixed in size. It can't change. You want it to change because you've heard so many, many, many times about how the universe is expanding and how there was a Big Bang. But as we're seeing here, in terms of cosmic expansion, no such Big Bang or that type of expansion could occur. And later on, we'll talk about Newton's G. You remember the famous argument about how Einstein changed his mind. G wasn't fixed as he originally thought, but it was actually variable, and this opens the door to a Big Bang. However, 
we can look at Newton's g and see that that actually isn't possible. And whether Einstein was borrowing Newton's g or he invented his own, it wouldn't make any difference. It's absolutely impossible that the universe could change in size internally speaking. But from the outside, cosmic expansion does occur. Let's now examine what happens when the universe expands. We'll just take it to one more level. And let's just assume that it doubles in size, although the illustration here doesn't exactly reflect that. But uh, when the universe increases in size, the length of the yardstick will increase. And of course, since the definition of length, natural definition, depends on clock speed, the clock must be running simultaneously faster when the universe expands. Even though internally there is no, or locally, there is no expansion felt. We can see the expansion from outside the universe in a fixed external dimension, and we can see these things occurring, but we can't see them from within the universe. Now, at this point, we going to neglect the force of gravity, we're just going to pretend that the universe is expanding in a, at a uniform rate. And so we could call that free expansion. And when that universe expands, of course, we don't know. Everything is exactly the same. Nevertheless, we will see that as objects are moving away from us that there is a Doppler shift and in that means that they will the light that we receive from objects that are receding from us will be shifted towards the red of course if everything else is equal we won't see that um, there will be no shift towards the red on the other hand we do see a shift towards the red of distant objects on average. We're not talking about objects that are for some reason moving towards us with the blue shift or away from us with the red shift. We're looking at the overall picture. And as a matter of fact, if we measure the distance of those objects, they remain the same. And that's why the physicists call this gravitational redshift. And we're going to take our first step towards a departure from that point of view right now because if the universe is expanding in this cosmic way, distances will remain the same that we measure because the yardsticks will increase proportionally to the size of the universe. However, there will be a redshift. We wouldn't see it, but we do. So how do we explain that? And it isn't gravitational redshift, and we know this, but, or I know it, and they ought to know it. So what actually is going on? Well, what's going on is, is that light having no mass whatsoever actually is being, is, is expanding along with the expansion of the universe, and that expansion is what light is measuring. Light is actually measuring the expansion of the universe from the outside of the universe because it isn't traveling within the universe. And this is the crucial fact that explains the so-called gravitational redshift. And this is what you have to understand. So the clocks and the uh, Doppler effect, their background is the same as the fixed external yellow colored dimension and that's because that's where light is traveling and that's where a lot clock speeds are changing but we don't see that and these proven facts are actually that are attributed to proving Einstein's relativity prove nothing of the sort I don't want to accuse anybody of deliberately lying but that just isn't the case that <clears throat> that the universe is expanding within our internal frame of reference. So what's happening here is that we're seeing the rate of expansion 
expressed in terms of of what they what the physicists call gravitational redshift. Well, let's take a look at the surface of the Earth, and this will help us. The force of gravity there is 9.8 meters per second per second. So there's an acceleration there. Well, we'll forget about that acceleration for a minute and just take a look and see what happens as we travel away from the gravitational influence of the Earth. If we do that and our yardstick gets larger because actually space is expanded. The farther you wait, get away from gravitational a source of gravitation, the yardstick will expand and clock speed will increase, but locally there's no difference. These are just inferences we make because we see the wavelength shift as it leaves Earth. And the funny thing is, is that <clears throat> the rate of acceleration of light, and this is scientific fact, they didn't make this up, it's exactly opposite the rate of a falling body. So the rate of acceleration of light leaving the surface of the Earth, near the surface of the Earth, is 9.8 meters per second per second, exactly the opposite of a falling body. And of course, light will continue to accelerate as it leaves the Earth, exactly in the same way that uh, bodies become more, less and less attracted to the Earth. Of course, we haven't talked about the cause of gravity at this point, but we're talking about the fact that light accelerates without any particular physical explanation whatsoever. We just, physicists just call this gravitational redshift. But it isn't gravitational redshift. What's actually going on here is that the universe is expanding and pushing light away from the Earth. If you can see that and you can accept that, you're well on your way to understanding how the cosmic, how, how the cosmos actually functions and how it works. We're, this is our first step. It's a stepwise process. You can understand what's really going on here. So this is the Doppler shift that we're seeing is not gravitational. We can't just dismiss it as gravitational redshift. It's attributable attributable to expansion of the universe in a way where our dimensions remain exactly the same. The internal measure of density and perception of density remains exactly the same. So there's no overall increase or decrease of the force of gravitation within. So if you can understand these things, then you're well on your way to understanding why there could not have possibly been a Big Bang. But we're going to go farther than that and explain more about what's actually happening here. Pause and reflect. If the universe is expanding uniformly in the cosmic way, where raisins expand internally at the same rate, then a Doppler redshift would occur. Well, since everything expands at the same rate, we could not see this internally unless expansion is a property of matter. In that case, objects of greater mass will expand more rapidly. Hence, the so-called gravitational redshift physicists claim is the cause of that effect. But whatever it's called, we can clearly see that bodies of greater mass exhibit redshift in proportion to their respective masses. And this can be easily explained by uniform expansion of the universe as we see in this diagram. However, note carefully that in reality, the gravitational redshift of light moving away from Earth is not constant as it would be with uniform expansion of the universe, but it accelerates. Since the rate of travel of light away from Earth is the precise mirror image of the accelerating rate of falling bodies, it can only mean that the rate of expansion, cosmic expansion, of space is accelerating. 
Mm. This is the second of a series of correct inferences that match incorrect inferences that are contrary to the dogma of physics. The rate of cosmic expansion of the universe demonstrated by gravitational redshift accelerates in perfect synchronization with the opposite rate of falling bodies. Think about that. This last illustration shows a second level of expansion. But this time, the rate of expansion has doubled to match the doubling of the rate of falling bodies, at least initially. Uh, the increase in expansion is, is constant, but okay, so while uniform cosmic expansion nicely explains the Doppler shift of bodies proportional to mass, the doubling of the rate of cosmic expansion matches the acceleration rate of falling bodies. Hence, the object which falls at 9.8 meters per second on Earth will increase to 9.8 times 2, or 19.6 meters per second. It is a scientific fact proved by many experiments that the increasing rate of falling objects would be precisely matched by the cosmic acceleration of expanding mass in proportion to the mass of those objects. This is also proof positive that only accelerating expansion could be the cause of gravity and that gravity expands with a force proportional to the density of matter in a given region. Okay, so in just a very few minutes, we have proved that the cause of gravity is the acceleration of cosmic expansion. This is new to the human mind, but if you carefully trace back through the steps of logic, you will begin to see how this must be the only correct inference for the cause of gravity, at least if we start with the assumption that there is such a thing as cosmic expansion. But this assumption is proved at the start with experiments such as Pound-Rebka, which show that clock speeds shrink at lower gravitational potentials. This can only mean that both space and time expand or shrink together because the rate of cosmic expansion depends on the mass in a given region. However, these, however, these effects are not a matter of experience. If you fell into a black hole, your meter stick and clock would measure exactly the same locally. They wouldn't become a singularity. This is fact supported by rigorous experiment. Not to say that you wouldn't be crushed by the force of gravity. But let's take another few minutes to incorporate these facts. And please ask me any questions down below if you need to. Okay. Uh, Time for coffee. This illustration is complex, but it tells us everything we need to know about the cause of gravity and the evolution of the universe. And it isn't what the physicists have been banging into our skulls for over a hundred years. Let's explore the real universe in greater depth. If the cause of gravitational effect is the acceleration of cosmic expansion in proportion to mass, which we approved, it is perfectly safe to conclude that the universe as a whole expands at a rate proportional to its mass. And just as the rate of fall of bodies at the surface of the Earth is equal to the rate of expansion at the surface of the Earth, that the universe as a whole can only be expanding at an accelerating rate. And we know from careful scientific measurements and Doppler effects that the acceleration due to gravity matches the acceleration of light in the opposite direction. So it is proved conclusively at this point that any Doppler change in the velocity of light depends on the difference in rates of cosmic expansion between any two given points. This depends on their difference in mass and defines the gravitational potential. Thus, 
since the rate of accelerating expansion at the surface of the Earth is equivalent to gravitational potential at that point and depends on the mass of the Earth, it can only be that the surface of the universe also has a gravitational potential, a gravitational potential, and that this gravitational potential matches the difference in the expansion of the universe as a whole. In other words, the gravitational potential at the surface of the universe is the speed of light. The expansion of the universe actually defines the speed of light. Take a break and think about that for a few minutes. Ask any questions below that you need to and we'll come right back. This illustration is rather complex, but it tells us everything we need to know about the cause of gravity and the evolution of the universe. And it isn't what physicists have been banging into our skulls for over a hundred years. Let's explore the real universe in greater depth. If the cause of gravitational effect is the acceleration of cosmic expansion in proportion to mass, which we know, it is perfectly safe to conclude that the universe as a whole expands at a rate proportional to its mass. Combined mass, just as the rate of fall of bodies at the surface of the Earth is equal to the rate of expansion at the surface of the Earth, then the universe as a whole can only be expanding at an accelerating rate in proportion to its mass, m. Well, we know from careful scientific experiments and Doppler effects that the acceleration due to gravity matches the acceleration of light in the opposite direction. So it is proved conclusively at this point that any Doppler change in the velocity of light depends on the difference in rates of cosmic expansion between any two given points and that this depends on their difference in mass. Thus, since the rate of accelerating expansion at the surface of Earth is equivalent to gravitational potential and depends on the mass of Earth, it can only be that the surface of the universe also has a gravitational potential that matches the expansion of the universe as a whole. Though as Newton taught us well, this force dissipates rapidly with the square of distance from the center of mass. And since the force of gravity on the surface of Earth matches the velocity of light propagated by the opposite action of expansion, the rate of expansion and gravitational potential of the universe as a whole can only be the velocity of light c. If you think this through carefully, you can see that it can only be true, that this is a fact. And this means not only that the velocity of light c is equal to the rate of expansion of the universe, but that the velocity of light in general is the result of cosmic expansion, expansion proportional to ambient mass. How can that be proved? If this is true, then the basic speed of light c cannot be from transmission from point to point through a physical medium but can only be propagated by expansion of the universe as a whole. And this means it would be equal in all directions from all points in the universe, even accounting for Doppler effects on the local level. This is what the Michelson-Morley experiment proved. Whether predicted by Einstein is it is claimed or not, the experiment says nothing about relativity. It only proves that light is propagated by the excuse me, light is propagated by the cosmic expansion of space. Again, light is propagated by the cosmic expansion of space. The speed of light is equal to the gravitational potential of the universe as a whole. Are you pondering how the force of accelerating cosmic expansion of matter could really cause the opposite force of gravity? If this isn't intuitive, it should be. The principle was firmly established by Newton with his third law of gravitation. Quote, every action creates an equal and opposite reaction. And that's exactly what we see happening with accelerating expansion in this exercise. Keep looking at the illustration. 
the outward force of expansion at all points, though only observable from outside the universe, creates the equal and opposite force of gravity experienced within the universe. Thus, the force of gravity and full velocity of light can only be sustained by continuous expansion, not just relative expansion between objects as gravitational potential, but by the universe as a whole. However, even though dimensions and the speed of light, a little c, remain constant as perceived within the physical dimension, the outer size and velocity of light of the universe must increase incrementally at the speed of light, little c. Think about it. The rate of expansion of the universe must be referred to as big C because the size and rate of expansion increases at the rate of little c, which is necessary to sustain gravity at all points inside the universe. And this brings us to another matter of utmost importance. We have established that the Doppler shift, considered as gravitational between stars within our galaxy, is due to the differential rates of expansion between them. And this establishes the gravitational potential between them. We can't measure any change in distance, so the physicists erroneously declare this effect as gravitational redshift, not realizing that light is propagated by expansion outside the physical dimension and is a Doppler effect if indeed space is expanding at an everlasting accumulated rate as I claim why don't we see a progressive increase in redshift indeed there is more than one answer <clears throat> but the first or main answer is that the magnitude of this effect must be equal to the differential rate of expansion between little c and the accumulated rate of expansion big C from moment to moment mind you but since the universe is has been expanding and accelerating for at least 14 billion years, according to the physicists, and more likely even forever, this effect would be exceedingly small. Exceedingly small. However, we must assume that it's there, and indeed this progressive redshift does surface on the intergalactic level where physicists have seized upon it and correlated it with linear distance measured as brightness. This is the progressive redshift physicists wrongly point out as proof that the universe expansion is accelerating, again not realizing that light travels outside the fixed dimensions of our physical reality. So on the cosmic level they're right, but distances between galaxies are fixed on average as are all points inside the universe. So, in essence, this completes my mission to explain and prove the cause of gravity as a result of cosmic expansion. That accelerates in proportion to the mass of a certain object or region in space, but which preserves fixed dimensions of time and distance within the physical universe of our experience. This isn't a, an idea or a theory, this is a fact. Everywhere we take our ruler and clock, even into a black hole or to the edge of the universe, dimensions remain fixed within our sphere. This is a fact, and since at the cosmic level the universe has always expanded at a constant rate, and always must, there cannot possibly have ever been a Big Bang. The illustration helps affirm this, because even though the density of the universe rapidly diminishes on the cosmic level, it remains constant in the physical dimension of our experience. You can see this. It's beginning to look like there was no Big Bang. But it's necessary to examine the uni units of Newton's G to make sure. If by any chance the units of Newton's G permit, perhaps the universe has been expanding within our level for other reasons. And the physicists pretty much hammered this into our brain. So we need to take a, a good close at, at Newton's G, uh, our next subject. So far, we see that true cosmic expansion 
forbids any future or past change in dimensions or gravitational force within the internally measurable universe, and therefore excludes the possibility of conditions described in the Big Bang that physicists insist took place. If it were possible by some other means, we would find it in the dimensions of Newton's universal gravitational constant. So we fix our attention now on this illustration where we examine the units of G. So the origin and age of the universe according to Newton's G um, lie, in this, lie in this equation. And we see from the equation that G is equal to a constant times uh, length cubed, or we're going to break this down into radius squared times radius over mass times second. Adjusting the units for more meaning gives us G equals a, gra a constant of proportionality times R squared times the acceleration of light divided by mass, M. Now we really can't interpret this any other way than by saying that G equals a constant times the radius of the universe squared over the mass M of the universe times the acceleration of light, little c. I really don't want to get into an argument over that, but um, no matter how you interpret it, um, well, let's just take a look and see to see if Newton's G gives us a way of saving the Big Bang, despite the laws of physics that demand that dimensions, including density, remain constant in the universe. So we now examine G, what is known as the universal gravitational constant, because it scales the attraction of bodies due to gravitational force to the conditions of the universe as a whole which we suspect cannot change just by examining the diagrams of cosmic expansion that we've had so far. So the value of G is determined by experiment, but the units of G are rarely considered important, other than to cancel units in the expression, Newton's expression, to yield a value for force F of gravity. But when we look at the value of G, or the units of G, these units define the three fundamental constants of the universe, total mass M, radius R, and the acceleration of light that combine to determine the immutable force of gravity. Stop and think. No doubt it might be argued that the units of G actually represent these fixed values, but that isn't exactly the point. They do, but that isn't the point right now. What we want to look at is that however they might otherwise be interpreted, there is no possible way to adjust them to match a reduction in the density of the universe. None. None. Now, we recall that this was Einstein's famous biggest blunder. After taking credit for what was rightly Newton's G, even if Einstein invented a different meaning for the universal concept of gravitation, we can clearly see, as he would have been acutely aware, that it could not be altered to allow for the changing universe necessary for a Big Bang. And this is why I'm convinced that he admitted to, this is why I am convinced that he admitted to this blunder only to appease the Big Bangers, a wise political move, but a consciously dishonest one. It just doesn't work. So, of course, on the cosmic scale, as measured externally, the universe must have shrunk dramatically over time, going backwards, so maybe we could extrapolate backwards to find an age and point of origin of the universe, neglecting the fact that clock speed and dimensions would have never changed, at least not internally, if the value of big C were to intersect in the past with the value of little c, that would have snuffed the acceleration required to sustain gravity. Poof! The universe would have disappeared or appeared at that point. But even if there were such a point of intersection, conditions inside the universe would have remained constant, never matching the Big Bang conditions put forth by the physicists. So for now, 
we can state confidently that no Big Bang could have occurred. But since the value of big C diminishes, diminishes in linear fashion at the rate of little c going backwards, it is conceivable that there was a definable instantaneous origin to the universe. Perhaps it's time to bring better minds to bear on that question, but my gut instinct is that just as the internal universe can have no end, based on what we now know, it likely never had a beginning either. Uh, if that offends someone's religious convictions, remember we're talking about blind cosmic processes here, not divine intervention. Unfortunately, the James Webb Telescope will likely only be used to continue twisting observations to match a Big Bang. So I'm talking into the wind, I expect, but I'm doing the best I can to get the truth out there. And at this point, I think I'll take a break and finish this little exercise. If you have any questions, please state them below and, and please invite others to this discussion because there's no possibility I'm wrong. I know we have established the cause of gravity here and, uh, and other issues. So have a good day and thanks for listening. This is Alan Clue's closing.